Alright, welcome to another video, and before we get started, I'd like to take a quick minute to thank all the Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members whose names you see scrolling across the screen right now. Uh, they make this financially possible, and without you, I probably wouldn't be here making videos, so thank you. Welcome back to another video. So today we're going to be flying the Swordfish once again. Um, there's a couple of changes that I want to talk about, and I'll kind of explain what's going on there, and then we're going to just kind of leave you with the rest of the footage, because I don't really have a lot to explain other than what's going on i can cover that at the beginning of the video so rather than make it a long boring video with me rambling on about what i'm doing i'm just going to kind of explain it and let you enjoy the rest of the footage from there i might try to look for some uh free music that i can put on the video in the background just to kind of break the silence but anyway getting right to it you see we're in the air now and you'll notice that rather than showing you the recorded hdmi output from the walk snow video receiver like i typically do in all my recent videos anyway or most of my walk snow videos this one is using the files out of the vrx that's recorded on the sd card and it has the uh the osd and the little subtitle info rendered on there afterwards using the uh tool available um the reason i did that is because in the new Walksnail firmware that I'm using, which is 36.42.4, which was just released today being uh, December 13th, um, that's the day I flew this and the day I'm um, editing the video, but uh, that firmware was just released publicly today, and I'm using the XFAT version, which is the file system, the original Walksnail stuff was using FAT32 file system, and this firmware gives you the option to update the kernel to use XFAT, which allows files bigger than four gigabytes. Um, and in doing that, you kind of work around the uh, issue with the OSD desync that happens after the first file split. Uh, typically what happens on your longer flights, once your file reaches around 10, 11 minutes or so, the file size will get to four gigabytes. And at that point, it'll split into another file, and it'll keep doing that subsequently until the end of the flight, or the SD card's full, or whatever happens first. But the problem with the OSD was after that first file split, you would lose like a second or two of OSD information or something like that. I don't remember the specific details. It's been a while since I've kind of tested that. But your OSD would lose sync with the video, was basically what would happen after the first 10 or 11 minutes of flight. But using the XFAT file system, you can record your entire flight into one long file. And this is not a particularly long flight. It was around 15, 16 minutes or so from what I remember. But the uh, file size on this one was like 4.9 gigabytes. And you'll notice right up to the landing there, everything is all in sync because it's all recorded into one file. Um, now this firmware does give you an option to update to the, the same firmware but keep the old Linux kernel that runs on the uh, FAT32 file system and you'll still get the, the breaks at four gigabytes. And the reason they did that is that not everyone is gonna be concerned about longer flights. Uh, you know, the guys running quads and things that are typically fly you know, four or five minutes, six minutes, whatever. It's not an issue for you. But um, the reason you might wanna stick with the old one if you're not concerned about uh, files bigger than four gigabytes is there is a small chance that you could brick the uh, hardware, be your uh, video transmitter or goggles or video receiver module, whatever you're uh, flying with. You could possibly brick it if power is removed at the right time during the firmware update while the kernel is being replaced. Um, typically, I mean, I don't know the specifics if it's able to be recovered later there may be some way to do it i'm sure there's some way to do it because they i mean they soldered this hardware up with with no firmware on it and then the initial firmware is written to it so it's going to be possible to revive the hardware but chances are people are not going to be able to do it at home with the tools you have available um but it's really not that big a risk if you just make sure your battery's not dead um I wouldn't really recommend powering it off a power supply, off a mains power or something like that during the update in case in a very unlikely event you might have a power outage or a little brownout or something like that. It could render your hardware useless, but uh, just use a good charge battery and don't remove it until the firmware is 
finished updating and everything reboots and you should be good to go. Um, I've updated the hardware several times back and forth in all the testing we did for Walk Snail and never ran into an issue and, and personally I don't know of anyone that's ever bricked any hardware with it but they, they just want to make you aware that there is a possibility. Um, just make sure you have a good good reliable power source source during your uh, update. Um, but anyway, the other change is the uh, receiver. I'm using the Radio Master Express LRS 2.4 gigahertz receiver. The one that I showed recently in a little quick unboxing thing is the RP4TD, which is the uh, True Diversity 2.4 gig receiver for Express LRS from Radio Master. Um, I'll pop that one in here, just fly it around, and it's working well. I'll probably leave it for now. But um, you'll notice I'm doing a lot of really low-level fly-in in this video. And that's the last thing, the last change I want to talk about. Um, I'll put an image up right now that I kind of took a few days ago when I first put this up. But I'm using a tall antenna mast now. It's actually a 20-foot telescopic flagpole that I picked up on sale during Harbor Freight's uh, Christmas sale or whatever a couple of weeks ago. And I just got around to mounting it up to the shop recently and uh, trying it out. And basically what that does, it, it just raises my video receiver module. Um, I still have the module mounted on a tripod. That tripod is mounted to the top of the flagpole. So altogether I have about 25 feet of elevation above the ground. Is where my VRX is sitting with its antennas. And I'm running that down the same long... Uh, I had a 25 foot HDMI cable that I was using before to run back into the shop. And what I did, I just picked up another six foot extension, HDMI extension cable. And I kind of ran that into my little uh, weatherproof box that was already there for my analog video stuff outside the shed. And it just runs inside to my splitter. So basically the only thing I changed was added that six foot extension into the cables I was already using. But it proves to work fine, it's not a problem. Video gets through just fine with no issues. And uh, everything works as you see here. Uh, but basically by raising the video receiver up a little higher off the ground, normally I use it on, on just the tripod so it sits about 5 feet above the ground. Now it's about 25 feet above the ground. And in raising it up like that, I get a little bit better signal flying down low. Now I did do some testing last week. I didn't post it because it was kind of boring stuff. But um, I actually flew out with this tall antenna mass set up. I flew out to the river where I was getting around four miles or so range with this setup before and I was able to get like 4.2 so it wasn't a drastic improvement and, and honestly that little bit of difference could just be from day to day difference in in the weather the humidity temperature stuff like that um but I don't really see any improvement for range which is kind of what I was expecting but um I do see a lot better performance just flying down low so if I ever do get into any any ground FPV stuff to kind of explore around the local area, right around, around here, driving a little crawler or something on the ground, it's kind of something I've had in the back of my mind now for a while, but I just kind of never got around to doing it. I think this tall antenna would set up would work well for that. But even just flying to planes like this, exploring down low, I'm able to fly right down low as far, you know, the farthest trees I can get to out here, I can fly right down above the weeds and things as, as low as I can safely fly without worrying about the uh, video signal. But anyway, that's pretty much what's going on in this one. It's enough uh, rambling on. I just wanted to post this. It's been a while since I posted just a normal flying video on my channel without talking about a new product or testing something or whatever. I just wanted to kind of do a fun flight and post it. Um, as it turned out, the lighting wasn't the best. You can see it's pretty late in the day and overcast and wintry day. Um... The uh, wind was blowing a little bit off and on. It was pretty well calm when I took off, but even a little bit of altitude, you could start to see the plane get bumped around, and it was kind of coming and going on the ground, too. So it's not the smoothest flight, but it is a flight, and it was fun. Hopefully it was enjoyable to watch it. Um, that's what I have for now. I guess keep an eye out for what's to come in the future, and any questions, comments, put them below the video. And if you're curious about the new Walk Snow firmware, there is a link on the community tab on my, on my page, on my channel here. Where I talked about it, I posted that earlier today. Um, but otherwise, you can uh, just go get it from Walksnell's download page. And uh, I don't know where we're going to go from here. I don't really have anything planned right away, but probably just be some more typical flying stuff. Trying to do some more of that. 
as weather allows. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you for watching this video, and I will see you all in the next one.